I think all of us, at some point in our lives, and to some degree, have always been interested in the idea that most of us will never meet our soulmate. A soulmate being someone who we feel is as close to perfect a match as we'd ever want. This person would like some of the things you like, but have enough of their own interests to keep things fresh. They'd have the kind of career life balance you have. They laugh at the right jokes and love doing that thing you'd like with your butt. It's the idea that one person on this entire planet is absolutely perfect for you. But chances are, with seven billion people, you'll never meet them. Or will you? The perfect person only becomes so once you've met them. Robert Zajonk discovered something called the mere exposure effect. It refers to our tendency to like things far more if they're familiar to us. If you're exposed to something often, you'll like it more. Unless the exposing is being done by someone like your creepy uncle. Apparently, exposure helps to explain the concept of propinquity, which is a difficult word to say. But which is the idea that one of the main reasons you become attracted to someone is actually physical proximity. Yes, there are examples of people becoming infatuated with others over the internet, as I have experienced mostly on the receiving end. But isn't that too a kind of proximity? So perhaps it isn't the physical proximity, but the routine. The familiarity of meeting a person over and over again in whatever way you do this physically or metaphysically. In a series of studies by Leon Festinger in 1950, he showed that people who lived near to each other in an apartment complex were more likely to be friends than those who lived even slightly further away. Say, one door down or something. It's like convenience has something to do with it. Additionally, if they passed each other more often on the stairs or in the laundry room, they were better friends too. Okay, admittedly, this Sounds a little obvious when you look at it at first glance, but take a step back and think about that. Your friends were determined by convenience? Perhaps that should give you more motivation to not choose your friends based upon convenience and to seek out better ones or better soulmates. Perhaps convenience is a trap, but let's move on. So this study suggests that whilst it is random chance which decides those whom you meet, who you fall in love with is determined by the company you keep. Now this does happen, but how often do you meet a couple who met each other because they were both just perfect strangers and randomly walked into each other's lives in the bookstore or the grocery store? It sounds romantic, but how often does it actually happen? There's even movies about things like this, such as Before Sunrise or other movies I just can't think of right now. This has its own romantic essence to it, and I do know some people who have met this way. But in the real world, in the general population, how often does this actually happen? I wish I had some stats here to throw at you, but I do want to recommend a book to you, written by Aziz Ansari, if you guys know him. He's a, he's a comedian. He's also Indian, if that matters. But I guess he decided to be like, cool, I'm a comedian, but I'm also going to make this awesome research book about modern romance and do an investigation on it, which is what the book is called. Modern Romance, colon, an investigation. There's also an, a Kindle aspect to it, which is pretty awesome. You should go buy it. Anyways, in the book, he actually does his own research, uh, like focus groups. He collects data, like a professional researcher or someone really high in academia which is pretty impressive, I gotta admit. Anyways, there are numbers in that book and I, uh, I feel lazy because I don't have them for you right now. But on to the next topic. Now, another theory based on idealization kind of ties into the whole, we fall in love with people because it's a convenient thing. One of my favorite songs is called Galantis, Run Away. In the music video for this song, which I'm gonna try and link to in the description, uh, and this begins at around two minutes and 15 seconds, They've inserted a quote. Here's the quote. They say, searching for love is like searching for yourself. When you find yourself, you find love because they're one and the same. I don't care if I butchered the reading of that quote, 
you've got to agree that it's pretty profound. Now let's go back to the other theory we were talking about based on idealization. The theory, just like the quote, suggests that the ideal person is actually inside of you as much as you are inside of them. And as much as I wish I was talking dirty here, idealization involves you projecting your ideal characteristics on someone and then letting your brain Do fill it. in the gaps. Yes, Don't worry. Can. According to this theory, if the gaps that they fill in please you, you fall in love. If not, and you move on. We fall in love with the idea of things every day. The idea of your favorite jacket because you imagine it might make you look cool. I know mine does. The idea of a movie given from a trailer because you fill in the gaps and think, yeah, that'll be awesome. But this can many times be an exaggeration. An example would be when you saw the trailer for the movie Gravity. Our brains fill in gaps all the time to create works of fiction. And guess what? You're doing it right now. For example, you may think your eyes act like a camera, and what they take in yes, is what they see, but that's Just not really true. Your eyes are used to collect data from the world around you to build up a virtual picture in your brain. The same is true of do sounds it. and yes, any other can. senses. Your brain paints this virtual picture inside your head to create what we call sight and sound. And these virtual constructs are heavily influenced by our upbringing, our culture, and our experiences. This is why different tribes of people draw different things when they're asked to show what the perfect partner would physically look like. So if your brain does this all the time when seeing or hearing things, surely this too could occur when you fall in love. This theory does seem to ring true as often during the early stages of infatuation, you might underestimate or even idealize someone's negative attributes if they have enough positive ones to sway you. If someone is actually a dick, you might see them as confident. If someone is fat, they're curvy and at ease with their figure. If someone has no arms or legs, they're easily portable and don't require legroom on long haul flights. So could your perfect person be dependent not upon some random factor or a chance meeting, but also reliant upon your own personal preferences? So does that mean that if you're unlucky in love, do doing it. new things and yes, you changing can. your own personal horizons Just and interests could change who you are? Which in turn alters the ideal person inside your mind? Possibly. So what's up next in the insanity I just threw at you? Well, we'll be covering a lot more than love as a topic, as I know that's a little bit weird for this channel. If I get lucky, interview someone I recently contacted whom I've nicknamed Genghis Khan for the sake of this person's privacy that has slept with around 600 females, give or take. I guess when you get that high, you really do lose count. I'm interested in this person's psychology. Not in how they do it necessarily, but everything about it, or as much as they're willing to share. By the way, the historic Genghis Khan is this guy who just went around the world pillaging stuff and had sex with lots of women. And he's the alleged ancestor to one-fourth, yeah, one-fourth of the world's current population. 